as one of the people that actually likes Skyward Sword, Nintendo did a pretty bad job of making this remaster look appealing. They had set the bar pretty high with Ocarina of Time 3D by remaking almost all of the assets, overhauling the lighting and effects, increasing the frame rate, adding touch and gyro control, and including the Master Quest and Boss Rush modes. All of that was $40. Majora's Mask 3D was even more hands-on, for better or worse, at the same price. Wind Waker HD was more rushed and upscaled the textures instead of drawing new ones, but it still managed to look and sound more modern with a new lighting system and soundtrack, and the few gameplay changes it made packed a lot of punch. That one went up to $50. Twilight Princess HD was the first remaster that failed to update the visuals in a significant way. Nintendo had outsourced it to Tantalus, who did draw new textures for the game but didn't enhance it much further despite the dated visuals. There were a few gameplay tweaks, especially at the start, but nothing that seemed as important as the previous games. I didn't even bother to pick it up, but it was at least still $50. Skyward Sword HD was also handled by Tantalus, and this time the visuals were touched up even less. It's partially emulated and looks mostly similar to what you would get running the game at 1080p in Dolphin. A lot of textures seen in cutscenes appear to have been upscaled in some way, but many of those found in normal gameplay are still low res and look very rough. In some cases, textures that are literally at N64 resolutions appear untouched. It seemed like the game would be a 60 frames per second upgrade and nothing more. And on top of that, it costs $60, which is not only more than the previous remasters, but 10 more than the original game itself, and 40 more than the Wii U version, which is still for sale. If you search Skyward Sword on Nintendo.com, you end up with these juxtaposed price tags, and it's not exactly a win for the HD version. And beyond that, maybe the single biggest improvement to the game was locked behind a $25 amiibo. When you spend $60 for a light remaster of a Wii game, you don't exactly expect to find a further bill for quality of life improvements. Those are supposed to be what you're paying for in the first place. And of course, Nintendo has fucked up the supply and the damn thing is already sold out. Amiibo tend not to stick around for long, as I know from the $300 price tag on the squishy Metroid Amiibo I missed out on. And after a pandemic year where everything was hard to buy, tying big game improvements to a plastic doll that's destined to go out of stock is especially shitty. I wanted to get that point out of the way first, because once you get past the greed, this is actually a pretty nice release. It is the weakest remaster so far when it comes to graphics, but you could argue that Skyward Sword needed an overhaul less than the others. Even with mostly Wii assets, it can still look extremely vibrant and clean at times. The game was supposed to look like a playable Cezanne painting, and it often gets extremely close. They developed a version with more advanced visuals when testing styles for Breath of the Wild, which is also where Wind Waker HD came from, and it's disappointing that this release didn't implement any of that. But prioritizing 60 frames per second in a game based on motion control was absolutely the right decision. The game may look the same, but it's so much smoother to play and the sword behaves a little better than it did on Wii. The Joy-Cons have better sensors, and the only real obstacle to porting the controls was that Switch has no sensor bar to automatically recenter with, but that's easily handled with Y becoming a manual recenter button. You can even press it during cutscenes. You do have to press the button a lot more often than I'd like, and the cursor especially seems to get off course when aiming, but it's overall a better experience than before. The Wii Sports stuff that made it into the game is still fun to me, and I actually miss being able to roll bombs like this. One of the best changes is that the cursor is now faster and moves with the kind of sensitivity players would expect after more modern games like Splatoon. The alternative button controls are a great addition, and while I think you'd miss the point to play without the sword play the game was designed around, I fully support having the option. It should make the game far more accessible, and I actually started using it myself every time I made an extended bird trip. Pressing A to flap instead of waggling over and over makes the sky so much less annoying to get across. I really wish they had also allowed button flapping when motion was enabled to eliminate the need to change the setting at all. Camera control is a huge upgrade that they for some reason didn't make a big deal of in the reveal. It's a natural addition that makes the game more comfortable to play and suits some of the boss fights extremely well. It's unfortunately disabled when running, which is very frustrating since you sprint most of the time that you play. You basically have to settle for only using the camera when resting the stamina gauge, and I don't know why, as it's really easy to hold sprint and push the stick at the same time. The camera also locks up at various points in the game. In the footage you're seeing, the stick is being held the whole time, but the turning abruptly stops for a second when reaching a specific spot. If a fan mod were patching camera control into an old game, this kind of thing would be acceptable, but in a $60 remaster, I expect that camera to work all the time. For $60, I also think haptic feedback should have been included, because as far as I can tell, it feels like standard rumble. It's becoming unclear why Nintendo added haptics in the first place when so few games bother using them, and this game has a lot of actions that probably would have been good showcases for it. It might have even helped with one of the control problems, which is that Link's sword can be blocked in the game while in the real world your arm keeps swinging all the way through. Having a realistic and detailed feeling clang might have actually helped you keep track of where the sword is supposed to be during battles. The biggest overall improvement is that the game annoys the shit out of you less. 
Fi's intrusions are mostly optional now. It's obvious why that would be a plus, but you don't fully appreciate it until you see that sword glowing over and over and realize that each of those times the game would have ground to a halt on the Wii, and usually for something obnoxiously obvious and stupid. The text is also faster and most scenes can be skipped completely. Most of the characters that used to force your attention are now optional to interact with, and playing without those interruptions makes it clear how devastating they were to the pace of the intro. I like the story in the game, but it just took way too much time when starting a new file. This is probably the best demonstration a video alone can give. On Dolphin, I'm reading the text as fast as I can. On Switch, I'm exiting the scene outright. By the time I regain control on Dolphin, I've already visited Groose, gotten my sword, found my bird, and am beginning the wing ceremony on Switch. And even if you do watch the scenes, the faster text keeps you from getting bogged down in them for too long. When you add all of this up, Skyward Sword HD is actually doing a lot. It definitely seems like a bigger effort than Twilight Princess HD was, but it doesn't fundamentally change what the game is. If you hated it on Wii, you'll hate it here. The motion may be improved, but the enemy design isn't. Instead of fighting naturally, every enemy approaches you with their sword held out either vertically or horizontally. You have to swing in one of two directions to beat them, and that's the battle. It's pretty much the same fight every time, and they could have done a lot more with motion than this. There really aren't many games with one-to-one -one sword play, so I end up talking about Red Steel 2 a lot, but that game had much deeper combat and more creative ways to attack. Skyward Sword is also padded to hell and back in the second half in a way that makes Wind Waker's Triforce quest seem like a quick trifle in comparison. There are only three areas and you'll go back to them again and again to do a thing, then go somewhere else to get a thing, then go back again to do a thing, and get sideswiped by an escort mission, and then do the thing. In one case, you even do a temple a second time over. The same boss appears three times and you attack pretty much the same way three times in a row to beat him. The last two fights were even pretty close together in the game and I don't think anyone would have minded merging them into one slightly larger battle. Skyward Sword was developed as if the staff was deathly afraid that the game was coming up short when it probably would have been one of the longest Zeldas even without the padding. You could cut out the entire final quest, which includes some pretty awful swimming and stealth segments, and it would still be a very full game. And I think a better one. Between all of the fetch questing, there's an incredible amount of flapping across the sky, and this might have been the biggest missed opportunity to improve the game. They could have allowed warping between bird statues to cut down on travel, at least between bird statues within the same area. If you want to warp to the other side of a province, you have to do this ridiculous maneuver where you fly out, do a U-turn, and drop back into the clouds to get to the other bird statues. The amiibo paywalled mechanic came close to offering a solution by letting you warp out and back in from any point on the surface without needing a statue. It doesn't solve the problem, but there are times when that would have been really handy. You know, handy if it were possible to buy that $25 mechanic, which it isn't. The strengths of the game are enough to make up for these problems, and I completely stand by what I said years ago, apparently, which is that this game succeeds at everything Breath of the Wild didn't. Even the most mediocre dungeon has some really cool theme and distinct style to it. And even the most average boss is a fun and creative fight. I never noticed it before, but the Ancient Cistern has a little bit of Majora's Mask's theme-oriented dungeon design in it, with Snowhead Temple's rising central tower combined with Great Bay Temple's water pipe puzzles. And all of it is framed within a Paradise and Hell split drawn from old Japanese literature. They managed to layer a lot of ideas and the temple is still easy to understand and keeps a fast pace. Skyward Sword is on a completely different level than Breath of the Wild when it comes to its dungeons, and playing again made that gulf in imagination more apparent than ever. It's not as expansive as Breath of the Wild, but the game also gives you a huge amount of side questing and collecting to do. And if you want my advice about how to collect the bugs, here's what I do. I walk up real quiet with the net, and then I do this. I just do this. There's not much more to say about Skyward Sword HD. It's just a nicer version of an old Wii game. The metric I've been using to judge remasters lately is to compare them to what I can get from an emulator. If the remaster has no advantages, then it sucks at its job. New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe was mainly a 1080p resolution bump, and I can easily get that from Simu. In this case, Nintendo has made something that puts Dolphin to shame. I don't think I could ever go back to the Wii version after getting used to the camera, high frame rate, and far less annoying characters on Switch. If it were $50 with no amiibo scamming, I'd actually be really positive about it, but the way Nintendo has priced this does make it harder to recommend. You'd have to be really into Skyward Sword, having it in your top three Zeldas, for this to be an easy purchase. And according to the internet, there are nine people who feel that way. If you aren't one of them, I don't think you should bother. It'll probably sell incredibly well anyway, because that's just how the Switch works. Then Nintendo will be emboldened to go even further next time. Maybe lock the ending of the game behind an amiibo. Why not? But for now, this is where they've lowered the bar too. And you have to decide for yourself if it's worth giving in for the sake of a surprisingly decent remaster. 
And here we are again to look at Skyward Sword HD, Nintendo's attempt to revive the long dormant Skyblades franchise. And straight away we can see the bespoke Tegra X1 tech in the form of triple planar bourgeois tessellation, a sort of texture folding that gives the trees an almost tree-like appearance, and from any angle, be it leftways, forwards or rightmost. It's the only effect in the game and it's a big one. So how does the engine manage this? Using our frame time analysis machine, we determined that the game is running. But what of the new controls then? The original Skyward Sword controlled with a series of swoops and flicks, but now all input is handled via a single large button. Frankly, we would have preferred two or three more. The reality is that Nintendo's aging server array likely couldn't process the netcode for enhanced input. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, as it were. Longtime Sword series fanatics will rejoice that they can play as Zelda once again, while newcomers are likely to write the game's existence off as a total hoax. And in the here and now, we still cannot rule out the possibility that it is. Right, that's all for me then. As always, stay tuned to Digital Underground for more updates as they come.